I, I think you are a renowned hacker. You are a iconic figure. You're a programmer, entrepreneur, and everything. And you even are taken up by rappers in Japan. So I think um, that is very rare for people in political worlds to become text for rappers. I am from the World Federation of Public Health Associations and I'm into public health. You know that we in public health always struggle with protecting the individual's freedom and protecting the population health. Professor, sorry. Yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, sorry, it, because it was a uh, test. Yeah. Uh, Minister, hello. I'm so sorry for interrupt, uh, interrupting you. Uh, I will leave the session and please, uh, please uh, start again. I'm so sorry because I was there to test. Okay. So, uh, okay. Okay. So no we, we shouldn't start. do anything, right? I, no, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay, I'll, I'll just be standing by or yeah, sitting yes, by. Yes, okay. yes, please stay, okay. please stay. I'm just, I, I just okay. do. Thank you very much. Have a okay. great day. Bye-bye. Okay. So, here again. Hello, Audrey, if I may say so. You are a iconic person. You are an entrepreneur, you're a hacker, an activist, politician. And um, as I have learned, you even became the text for a Japanese um, songwriter, or let's say rapper. Very few people have this portfolio, if I may say so. And myself, I'm Bettina Boris, CEO from the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and I am in deeply into public health and to global health. And you know that in public health, we have this balance, this fine balance to protect individuals' freedoms, personal freedom and population health on the other side. So, I come with a question. You have been praised in Taiwan and you personally for being instrumental in getting through the pandemic crisis. How do you manage this basic public health balance while managing a crisis? Thank you. Uh, this is a great question. In Taiwan, we managed to counter the COVID-19 with no lockdown and an associated infodemic with no takedown. And indeed, in both public health and also in, I guess, public mental health, it is uh, essential that people are guarded against either viral biological virus or viral conspiracy theories, as it were. Uh, and what we have found that works reliably is what we call humor over rumor. Indeed, uh, rapping is a really good way to deliver a lot of information in their entertaining form in a short time span. We also work with professional communicators who, for example, work out this very cute Shiba Inu. It's a spokes dog for the Central Epidemic Command Center. Because when the minister tells someone to wear a mask to protect against their own unwashed hands, it's difficult for other people to share this message. But if it's a very cute dog putting their foot to their mouth and saying uh, during the pandemic, it's very important to not do what a dog does here because the dog is so cute. People share that in a what we call a viral meme. That is to say people understand social distancing, like when we're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away or wear a mask, outdoor, keep two Shiba Inus away from one another or wear a mask, again, in a very entertaining and engaging form. And when people understand the public health, they become a little bit of a uh, amateur epidemiologist. They can share the correct information in the form that's most amenable for understanding to their friends and families. And that beats any top-down program. Oh. Thank you very much. That is already mentioning a next word, which I would like to pick up. It's infodemic. We are all dealing, I think, around the world with the pandemic and its infodemic. And the use of messaging, 
and the communication that you nicely described is crucial to getting through a pandemic, I think. There are now also politicians using social media um, to spread, I would call it, um, wrong messages, and at least in the sense of public health, wrong messages. What do you think about this and how would you handle this if you were not in Taiwan? If I'm not in Taiwan, I will start deploying the Taiwan model as we introduced to many <clears throat> nearby jurisdictions by building a alliance of fact checkers. For if you uh, have sufficient amount of time and effort put in into fact checking by the social sector, not the public sector, by professional journalists, by people who study media competence classes in their primary schools or middle schools or high schools, these are the people that you want to fact check the presidential candidates as they were uh, deliberating and debating uh, for the January 2020, for example, in Taiwan, our presidential election are fact-checked by thousands of amateurs but when they participate in the newsroom when they become the providers of the facts that can fact check even the three presidential candidates uh, they undergo this transformation from media literacy which is about being viewers and consumers to media competence which is about producers of media and they become inoculated against uh, the polarizing messages or the oversimplification that some politicians uh, likes to uh, say on social media. So I think the main way to defend against polarized uh, wrong information by politicians is by engaging in media newsroom work, media competence work, starting from basic education. Oh, I see. You want us all to become fact checkers and um, message producers. That's right. In our spare time, of course, not uh, oh. full time. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll pick that up again and hope to get it further. My then next question would be, I told about there are countries outside Taiwan and in the pandemic, I am at Geneva, we are close to UN organizations, we see that multilateralism is under challenge quite challenged these days, especially as we are now discussing access to vaccines. How do you think that your strategies could help global governance? I think, uh, first of all, we are uh, part of the COVAX arrangement, even though Taiwan is not officially part of the World Health Organization, we are here to help and also contribute our own research capabilities and vaccine production capabilities. We have two vaccines are now in phase two, and if they do well, uh, it could be rolled out under EUA. And so uh, what I'm saying is that Taiwan is all about sharing the model that that worked and what didn't work for in 2003 Taiwan was hit quite badly by SARS nowadays we call it SARS 1.0 uh, by SARS and then uh, we did um, a lot of things wrong the municipal government was saying different thing from the central government people were panic buying N95 masks uh, leaving the frontline health workers having a shortage of masks uh, there's uh, a lot of um, uncertainty and doubt when we barricaded the hoping hospital unannounced and so on uh, but after that we wrote a playbook the SARS playbook the constitutional court of Taiwan charged the legislator saying when SARS 2.0 came uh, and it will come uh, we don't know whether a decade or two in the future but it will come when SARS comes again we need to have the public institutions institutionalized when the memory was still fresh in 2004 so we wrote out new legislations we wrote out the central epidemic and command center. We roll out the IC card for universal health care and so on, and all of which we are happy to share the playbook with the world this time around because we essentially play the SARS 1.0 playbook very early on, like January the 1st of 2020. Uh, that's at least 10 days before uh, the WHO itself. So we would like to participate in not only the early warning systems so that we can warn other ministerial positions around the world for possible human to human transfer mission, but also work with 
the other jurisdictions as uh, maybe more of their citizens are vaccinated and we can uh, take a little bit of breath until I guess SARS 3.0 comes. We don't know whether next year or 10 years from now and help them to institutionalize the kind of change that we did in 2004 when it comes to contact tracing, the communication, as well as many other parts of legislature. OK, so in the global setting, uh, we love the hashtag Taiwan can help. And you said another word very importantly preparedness it was among the lines you talked about the first SARS crisis and I know from one of your interviews that you said you um, it takes one pandemic to be well prepared uh, and I think the experience of the first SARS was very important and you also talked about institutions what do you think that countries should do first? What do, should they strengthen in their preparedness for a coming next pandemic? What would you rank as most important? Is it institution? Is it communication? What is your most important part in preparedness? I think the most important part is the preparation of the administration's capabilities. That is to say, in Taiwan this time around, we did not need to declare a state of emergency. Uh, and so everything that the administration does is pre-approved by the legislature, overseen by the legislature. I say this is the most important thing because if someone in the administration is working in a state of emergency, almost by default, they will uh, make make some arbitrary choices uh, without very good justification or due process because it's essentially acting in a quite um, in the moment ad hoc manner, uh, which actually makes communication more difficult because uh, for the everyday person on the street to explain a ad hoc decision, uh, it's very difficult. It's almost impossible because maybe the person uh, making this policy is also just trying something out, right? But if you do have the pre preparedness of the Taiwan equivalent of the communication disease, uh, Communicable Diseases Act, then the communicable diseases uh, responses are all of them very easy to explain individually. Contact tracing, physical uh, distancing, uh, the use of masks to protect one's own face from one's own unwashed hands and so on. They are all very reasonable individually speaking. So uh, we can take a lot more time to prepare the message that will then uh, get, um, I guess, viral on social media uh, and prepare people for the next uh, epidemic. And so if the virus mutates and it will mutate, it is already mutating, uh, we can say, oh, now we have a longer asymptomatic uh, transmission. Now maybe airborne is uh, more uh, worth looking into and so on. And then we can just build on existing messages and inform the public that now we need to change this measure. But this is because we learned something more about the virus. But if we don't have an existing base on top to do this delta, then all of this will feel very arbitrary. This is a point about a legal framework, mm -hmm. a pre-existing legal framework. So this definitely leads us to questions of democracy, where you're also a strong, a strong defender of uh, digital de democracies. Let's That's right. So in the preparedness, you need strong institutions and you need, as I understand you, legal frameworks. How are our societies prepared to do that in a democratic way? Um, first of all, we need to make sure that legislators, like in Taiwan, there are four major parties in the parliament. All of them need to come to terms and will understand uh, the underlying both science and also technologies that's associated with the science. And so it is a form of public education that start with the legislators and their associates, but then uh, spread to the entire society using whichever language, culture or metaphor that is more most uh, fit for that part of the society to understand and to internalize and also uh, equal 
equally important is the on the algorithm side because during uh, the um, contact tracing, for example, we had to collect data in the places of entry, in the places of public gathering, even in the nightlife district of host and hostess, hostess boss. And uh, all of those data collection have their different parameters when it comes to cybersecurity as well as its privacy implications. Now, in Taiwan, we use a heuristic. We only use the data collection methods that are already there before the pandemic so that everyone has a uh, intuition, a good intuition about the privacy and cybersecurity parameters associated. Uh, and so if we prepare sufficient amount of that sort of information and uh, habits really, like using IC card to get uh, refillable prescriptions on pharmacies, when the pandemic actually comes, we can repurpose the system and say, just take your IC card like you would for the chronic prescriptions, and then you'll get 10 masks per two weeks in your nearby friend pharmacy that that is crucial and that's a way to do it um, so the strong democratic society participates knows has frameworks we see quite a lot of democracies being under pressure these days too do you think that these democracies I mean you are a younger one they're older ones um, do they need a new social contract? I think uh, while the societal memory of COVID-19 was still fresh, it's indeed very good time to have a public deliberation. Um, for example, what's the acceptable parameter for data collection for quarantine purposes? In Taiwan, the uh, digital fence is applied to the 14 plus 7 quarantine uh, period. It's quite invasive uh, in the privacy framework because uh, the telecoms know exactly where your phones are during the 14 day uh, quarantine. However, However, the telecoms already have that data anyway, and it's not like they're sending to other non-telecoms to process the data. Uh, and people are already used to receiving those location-based alerts uh, for earthquake warnings, for flood warnings, evacuation warnings, and so on. So we explain the digital fence in terms of those existing infrastructures. But for um, other maybe non-island countries that do not have earthquake and uh, typhoons all the time, maybe you do not have as much a experience with location-based alert systems, uh, but that will be a really good time right after the pandemic this time to have a societal conversation about how to enforce the quarantine and contact tracing too. That's, that's the next point. Everybody says islands are different. And you said, yes, we have to enter a social discussion, uh, perhaps to use the open window opportunity of the pandemic to look at how we want to live together. So social innovation is also one of your tools, I would say. Mm -hmm. For us, yourself part of a movement, of mm -hmm. an occupying movement, mm -hmm. do you think that social innovation goes by steps, by revolutions, by occupations, or how can you move forward societal thinking. Yeah, social innovation to me uh, requires this thinking that everyone's business uh, requires everyone's help. Uh, and of course, as you put it, the help is sometimes uh, like it trickles, uh, sometimes it's a storm, uh, depending on uh, most often than not uh, on how urgent is the uh, disaster, how urgent is the pressure. So for example, uh, to visualize the mask rationing uh, status um, the civic technologists in Taiwan develop hundreds of visualizations in chatbots, in maps, uh, in voice assistance, and so on, so that three quarters of Taiwanese population uh, last February uh, can have a visibility into which pharmacy near them still have some masks available. And it's done in a very, very short time and combining like thousands of people hour work into it. So that's for the 
crisis uh, work. And the same goes for the Occupy movement too. But even on a not so urgent uh, situations, even on a day-to-day -day situation, there is still a lot to be done by the social innovators. For example, uh, in Taiwan, a lot of social innovators see democracy itself as a technology uh, or a set of technologies. They're not only content uh, with, for example, uploading every person three bits of information every four years, which is called voting, by the way, but they want to communicate more into agenda setting. So they work on, for example, e-petition, participatory budgeting, sandbox applications, the presidential hackathon, the list goes on, so that everyone can participate in collective decision making and agenda setting, not just once every two years or four years. And that's something that we can all do day to day to foster social innovation on collective decision making. So for you, social innovation needs technology and technology is social innovation. It's kind That's of exactly right. And democracy is just another type of applied social technology. Yes, I'm in a country with a direct democracy, Switzerland, very old, but we are downloading the three bits of information still but very frequently, very frequently. That's right. The referenda system, I think, works like a clockwork. So it's definitely not just once uh, every four years. It's on all levels. Yes, but how could we get it in a better shape then in Switzerland, the clockwork? Uh, I think uh, the Switzerland uh, really has a model system uh, for what I call a transcultural republic of citizens in the sense that across the major cultures in Switzerland, people agree to the democratic process and agree to improve on the democratic process. So that's very commendable. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that in Taiwan, now that we have broadband as a human right, that is to say anywhere in Taiwan, even uh, almost 4,000 meters high on the tip of Taiwan. Anyone has 10 megabits per second at just 16 euros per month for unlimited data connection. If they don't, it's my fault personally. Uh, and so once we have that sort of coverage, we can actually bring the sort of deliberation that we have in our town halls and city halls to the virtual reality, to the virtual deliberation experiences so that uh, the conversation around, say, the participation budget or the sandbox application and so on involves not only people in the same community, they're still very important, but people from overseas who care about the community or who have lived in this community or who want to contribute to the community can also participate as digital doubles or digital twins to such discussions. But of course, on the face-to-face -face discussion side, uh, we don't ask people to come to technology. We still bring the technology to the people, but people are joined by people uh, from the great beyond. Okay, so you want a political space that is almost everywhere, on That's high right. top of yes. mountains and on the seashore. So, well, I know on my to-do list I have to climb your highest mountain still. Once I can travel again as, as a mountain fan, I, I always ask every Taiwanese friends about your highest mountain and they say, yes, it's feasible. So I know mm -hmm. I will have a strong internet connection up there and we could start the same discussion from my hiking spot. That's right. Uh, I had a conversation, uh, art actually, a uh, conversation with a curator from the New Museum in New York, and we had that discussion, uh, he in New York and me in here, wearing virtual reality headset, and our co-creation took place uh, on the height of the Matterhorn Mountain. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that is a Swiss mountain, and yeah. it was captured through the helicopter 360 imaging. And I think it really brings us together in a way that it's not achievable by two-dimension video conferencing. <laughs> That's true. We'll check that out for the next time. <laughs> so now we are already with this virtuality and uh, the techniques we are using, we are definitely in the, the, the global space. And in the global space where we do live, we have one, I think, important problem besides um, probably climate. We do have raising inequities, mm -hmm. a gap that is growing between those who have and those who have not. And we know that this influences all and every bit of our society, it influences mm -hmm. health. So 
I would have, I would love to have your views on how we can do something about or against growing inequity in countries that are high income, in countries that are low income, but also in between countries. Yeah, uh, in Taiwan, uh, our Gini index numbers are pretty good. Uh, and one of the reasons why is that not only universal health care is uh, spelled out in our constitutional amendments, but also the right to learn, especially on basic education, and the right to health uh, in all its forms, including preventative and public health, but also the right to communicate. And so these three form the kind of socialist core of our uh, uh, constitution and if any place in Taiwan doesn't have the access to learn to health or to communicate it's the state's fault uh, but of course on other parts of the economy like semiconductors that's pure uh, market economy uh, and so having these two cores working in conjunction with one another that's to say these uh, profit seeking businesses they do it for profit but with social purpose uh, and the uh, social sector do it for the purpose, but sometimes also with profit. And this makes it much more easy for the two sectors to work with one another on aspects like social entrepreneurship. For example, uh, this jacket that I wear is made out of like 12 recycled plastic bottles and like five cups of coffee being waste and so on. And just by demonstrating this trend of upcycling, it can convince the textile makers as well as fashion designers to work on circular design that is good for the planet but also good for their prosperity and so instead of saying that these two uh, are like the left and the right wing and they uh, balance each other I think it's best if we make them work together on the sustainable goals and then grow up wing that is to say to simultaneously fulfill prosperity on one side and equitableness on the other. Okay, this comes to an anti-polarization uh, view on social market and private markets mm -hmm. on systems that in former days have been opposed by a lot of people. So mm -hmm. you think that, okay, education, communication, health are the socialistic cores for mm -hmm. equity and they can go well together mm -hmm. with market economy. Mm -hmm. And they can do well also uh, by working on social innovation and entrepreneurship. And do you need strong frameworks and regulations to make them work well together? I think we need a strong social sector. In Taiwan, it used to be that if a company uh, abuses the planet or the people, then uh, there will be social sanctions against them. And many uh, large uh, enterprises uh, were gone because of the social sanction boycotting. Now for the Taiwanese young people, like in their uh, tens and twenties, uh, just doing nothing is a cause for social sanction against them. They must actively give an account of how much they are working on decarbonization, on preserving the planet and things like that. So standing by is no longer an option. And when you have a strong social sector like that, the market players will play in a way that is more pro-social and pro-planet. Oh, so if I get you right, in Taiwan, you get people into the social sector by well mm -hmm. by by forcing them, by asking no, them? No, by, by, by having fun, right? Uh, so uh, in Taiwan, for example, uh, there's a very strong homemakers union uh, that uh, advocates on environmental policies, but the main work of advocacy is just buying together. Uh, and so it's actually a consumer co-op uh, that encourages people to, for example, take uh, the plastic bottles and cases back when you're taking another monthly uh, uh, like grab uh, of the collective uh, consumer uh, market and you go back to the market by the consumer co-op you bring with you the empty bottles uh, that you have already peeled down the labels and they recycle it uh, right there so that it can be uh, remade into say uh, casings uh, for uh, the laundries uh, and the, um, the like the chemicals used for the laundries and so on the washing liquids and so uh, all this uh, 
imbues uh, in very young people, like it's in their everyday uh, life. It's not something that they specifically go out and do, but rather just by uh, come back to the consumer co-op and buy some new uh, washing liquids and so on. Uh, the idea of recycling and upcycling is automatically embedded in their work. And I think that is much better than just a once a year, um, like a tour or a journey or something. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Make it a habit. Make it your, your real life. That's right. And that is in, now, now we move from managing a pandemic to managing a whole society. Mm -hmm. And I know that you also are kind of fond of the SDGs mm -hmm. because you sometimes mention your job description as being written in the SDGs. Could you explain the 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 people listening ask what you think when you say that definitely so whereas the 17 sdgs um some of them are for economic prosperity some of them are for the planetary sustainability some of them are for an equitable society i focus specifically on the 16th and the 17th the 16th is about a open inclusive and responsible governance system and the 17th is about a partnership for those common goals so i often Often write my job description in terms of the 17 goals, for example, on enhancing reliable data, on promoting open innovation, and most importantly, on fostering effective partnership across sectors. But many people also say, hey, Minister, we don't have the 169 goals uh, targets uh, memorized. So I sometimes also translate that to poetry. Oh, I haven't seen the poems on SDG 17, that's mm -hmm. oh, you have to to send it. I want yeah, to it's uh, pinned on my Twitter. It's okay. literally my job description that talks about, for example, when we see the Internet of Things, let's turn it into an Internet of Beings. Yes, I I think this one is very beautiful. Yes, this one is very very beautiful. And as I don't want to take all your time today. I, I would like to ask you to, to say this, this kind of job description that you have, the internet of things, turn it into, if you could explain it to us or just say it, I like it very much. Okay, certainly. So my job description goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, Let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So beautiful. I hope that a lot of people listen. I hope that also places with civil unrest, with difficult situations, can listen to these words. And I think that um, you have to, to get your message through to other places in the world. If I may thank you very much, Audrey, for the time you spent with me, with our viewers, and all the best to Taipei. Hope to see everyone in person very soon. Yeah, yeah, same here. Have a good local time, everyone, and live long and prosper. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So I guess we're good. I think we're fine. I, I went through all the things, you know, I think it's as you are a holistic person. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that everybody asks Taiwan now, how did you manage? But managing the crisis means managing society. And for, for you, you get it always into one. And managing a society is not managing. It's the wrong word. That's uh, right. Yeah, like, it's like tending a garden. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it is. It's not because already managing makes this top down thing. And this is not, mm -hmm. not fine. I like the humanistic approach that you say we are in it in an 
in a society which is um, using all our competencies, all differences, as you always say, plurality. That's right. Um, and now what I have been talking, not talking with you, with a lot of people always say, uh, they ask about your, your, your attitudes to genders. I have a very mm -hmm. strong focus on gender because uh -huh. I think that the minority, the symbolic minority that is women, is still under scrutiny and under, in a lot of countries. And so I, I think that what, what feminist movements and other movements for so-called minorities did is helping, it's pacing the way for this societal approach. We are all one with different, whatever differences, but we are all in one. So I didn't ask you about that, but I know it's, it's, it's something that probably helps also to be more open, more friendly, more, more inclusive to others. And you really transmit this uh, feeling of being extremely inclusive yourself. I had That's to, right. That's I, had, right. Yes. I, I think your team, your team must mm -hmm. have it every day and say, oh, I'm part of the team. <laughs> that's that's right. Uh, my uh, team, uh, whenever we recruit someone, we always look for someone with a very distinct perspective, not uh, a overlap with a existing team member. And so, and they must be also as willing to give as they are here to take. And when you have all your teammates like this, it's a natural sharing and very inclusive uh, atmosphere. And I think it's the same really by taking all the sides, uh, we can apply it to all the structural issues like inequity, climate change, disinformation, and so on uh, that you mentioned. And it all requires us to essentially uh, look at it from the plural perspective because it could be fixed by mechanistic uh, way it has been fixed long ago yeah oh that's that's interesting how you create teams that you say i pick the differences i really mm -hmm. do i do uh, really try to get the differences into one and that's that's probably a way of getting best teams um right. to have all the aspects in one ah oh. Well, well, so we, we, I, I think we could continue a long time, but as I said, my last visit to Taiwan, I, I went every year, twice a year, uh, and, and, and went to the Global Health Forum and met your colleague, the health minister, Dr. Chen Shun. Uh, Chen Shu Zhong, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and, and give him my greetings. Um, yes, please, I will do so. Please, <laughs> my very friendly, we did a declaration of Taipei together on oral health, and I'm extremely um, fond of um, having done already a lot of things in Taipei and uh, with the Taiwanese people. So it was for me a double pleasure to, to speak to you. I had seen you on internet and everywhere, um, but having this exchange directly is for sure different. So, okay, maybe next time we can go hiking together once all of this is you over. Are, if you are someone <laughs> who goes hiking, I'm there. Okay. The Swiss mountains are there for hiking and the Taiwanese are there for hiking. That's right, that's right. Okay, yeah. till next time then. Uh, very so nice talking nice. to you. Thank you very much and um, have a nice end of the day. You too. Bye. Bye, Audrey.